core stories, ordinary Marines, extraordinary lives. Hey, everybody. Today we wrap up Core Stories' first season of podcasts. This is podcast number 10, and it is actually our first Core Stories authors podcast. And we interview one of the writers of Caesar's Great Success, which was written by Romero, Agostino von Hassel, and Gregory Staracci. And it was Gregory who sat down with me this week. And so we had a great kind of far-reaching interview all about how Caesar got the bellies fed of 5,000, north of 5,000 troops at any given time across thousands of miles of terrain and completely different cultures of cuisine over and over again. And it's, it's very interesting. And it's kind of, from a culinary perspective, it's perhaps even more interesting. But the logistics, the logisticians in my audience are going to love this book because <laughs> the logistics of this are no joke. Anyway, sit tight, enjoy, and I'll catch you on the backside. So, Meriwether, did I get it right? Right. Now, listen, how do I pronounce your last name, Gregory? Star- so, it's Starachi like Versace. Starachi. Beautiful. Because, yeah. you know, it's spelled, it's spelled like Star Ace. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got, well, you know, there's that's a story in and of itself i um, bet but you know i i actually grew up to race to race yeah. and many of us found like my father and uncle and brother found it was easier to pronounce it star race in a yes. public setting to race kind of you sort of lose it just the r gets swallowed it's it's it doesn't come out right people can't figure it out and so it's easy to say star race and that's how people can also spell it but uh, i went to italy and my brother also went to Italy at a separate time in our early 20s. And you go over there and it's, you know, Bienvenue, Senor Storace. And at that point, the first time you hear that is the last time you say it the old way. And you say, why are we saying our name the wrong way? So both he and I independently came back from those trips and decided to say it. Now, interestingly, when it was Starace or Starace, someone would take Italian and like, actually it's pronounced Storace, which everyone got all excited about. So they would informally call me Storace and now it's flipped. So now I say Storace and people go, you know, you can say that Starace. <laughs> and so I can't win. <laughs> I can't win at all. Oh my golly. I wish, you know, my name is Meriwether Ball. But when I tell someone over the phone, hi, this is Meriwether Ball, they say, well, hi, Mary. How is everything? Oh, I've got Miss Weatherball on the phone <laughs> every single time. Yeah. I mean, it happens. I don't know if it's the way I'm pronouncing it or enunciating it, but <laughs> it happens yeah. like every day. Yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah. But I think I like Starachi better. <laughs> so, so looking at your personal history, you, there is... Oh, he's curious, scratching his head about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Merriweather and that's Merriweather Clark, right? Or close. Or Merriweather Lewis. Merriweather Lewis, right? Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. But you're you're related to the Clark of the pair, yes? Or no? No. no. Merriweather Lewis. Actually, Merriweather is a family name, and if it's a given name, it's supposed to be a male name. He is the brother of a grandmother of mine. He was the brother okay. of a grandmother of mine. So the Merriweathers, this is how he got his name because it came through his mother's side. So his right, mother right. had to have his name, and her name and his name. So it's an old Virginia custom is to not give anybody first names. Like John, Charles, Mary, yeah. aunt. That's pretty rare. Usually it's these family names. And so that's how I wound up with that name. And my father is actually Meriwether, the exact same name, yeah. Meriwether Ball, yeah. but he's so, male, so it works out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess it was Ambrose's book, right? Who is the, the Lewis and Clark expedition. I got about halfway through it and then life took a few turns and it got put on the shelf and I did not pick it up, but it was riveting and I really have to get back to it. it just, it's, it's a period of history I don't really study much. So I kind of, I, I wanted more early American revolutionary period. So, but I wanted to, to study it because, you know, you, to know that period, you want to know what happens before and after. And, and I picked it up and God, I can't remember. It's, I think 
maybe having a baby might have might have, might have thrown it off. That'll do it. You know, the thing about Meriwether Lewis is that his life ended in so much mystery. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and so, and it was never really resolved. I don't, I don't think any of the descendants think it's resolved at all. But, but I think the far more important thing was the expedition. That sure. he was selected for the expedition. And when I'm reading your book, your your fabulous book, Caesar's Great Success. Thank you. I think about him. You know, it's nowhere near as complex as what Caesar accomplished, but just the constant adapting and overcoming. And how did you come to know Augustino? So, yeah, so Augustino, wow, he's a man of mystery, right? So I met Augustino... It was Fleet Week, and I was trying to remember this year exactly. So it was Fleet Week of 2000, and it must have been 2005. Oh, 15 so, years ago. Yeah, I met him. I was in New York. My unit had, I was with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. We had come back from Iraq. We were part of the Battle of Fallujah. And we were sent to go up for Fleet Week. I guess that happens June or July. I can't remember exactly. I think it's June. It's typically June. And while I was up there, my job was as part of the anti-terrorism force protection duties I had in my battalion. I was to liaise with local law enforcement and and community. Yeah, you know, gain insight as to threats against any of the Marines and sailors that were participating. And in the process, I met a detective, Marty Rodriguez, who I worked with on NYPD and a few others. And I think at the time I was thinking about getting out of the Marine Corps. And so I was really engaging the, some of the law enforcement up there with like NCIS and, and NYPD. And somewhere along the line, Marty Rodriguez put me in touch with Augustino. He said, here's a guy, he's connected to the Marine Corps. There's a lot of great things. You should meet him, he could help you out. So I met Augustino. I think I had lunch or something. You know Augustino enough to know he is very direct and to the point. And you have this meeting. He says a few words in it. And he's off out the door doing something else. And you're not really sure what the heck just happened. <laughs> and, and and you get some like, some, some, like a three-word text that says, you know, copy, follow up later or something. Oh, whatever, right? I, and, and so you get this. And then lo and behold, you know, emails come and phone calls come. And what he was doing is he helped shop my resume around. I was looking at getting out of the Marine Corps. While shopping my resume around, he very much pushed me to stay in the Marine Corps. Or I don't want to say pushed me, certainly encouraged me. And, you know, with that, it just kind of became a relationship. And uh, we did some work together on a couple of issues, some, some work with McClef. We wrote uh, an article for the Gazette. He asked me to review some books that he had been working on and provide some insights and you know a relationship was just kind of born over the years of this interaction and uh, and you know like classic military male interaction and uh, it's you know we, it's sort of these intense relationships for a while and then we don't talk to each other for two years and then we pick up right where we left off through a phone call or an email or someone has an interest that connects the other guy and we're right back at it and uh, he's just been really good to me for many years and has been a mentor and has been very gracious to invite me in on some of the projects he's been doing. And that's kind of where we are here today. Now tell me, tell me then, how did you, I mean, he's written, he's such a prolific historian, such a prolific writer and photographer. Right. And I mean, he's, I have a couple dogs and this is like my, I have a golden here, Augustus, and I've got <laughs> little blind deaf Yorkie Anna and they may kind of hijack the podcast from time to time yeah my, my dog just stays right below waist level so she can come in here unless she goes up on the couch and looks at me oh so the thing is that Augustino when he told me about this book I was like golly that's right up Augustino's alley you know he loves cuisine right you know he just loves history and he loves cuisine so my question is about the research for the book. I mean, I love that you write it like a Marine Corps officer would read it. You know, you would you would want to know every single de logistical detail and right. how sophisticated Caesar was in his leadership and 
broad thinking. I mean, I think that probably when it came to meeting the needs of his of his troops, he may have been a lot more open-minded than even today's leaders. Yeah, as so... Far, as far as meeting their needs with respect to the logistical issues. I mean, I, just mixing up, like you say, mixing up all these cuisines as he as he found himself in different environs. So so a lot to unpack there, right? I guess before we go any further, I do want to mention, we, we have Alex Merrow, who, who is our third co-author. And, and, and Alex, so there, man, there's a lot we, we can talk about. So maybe a brief history of the book, of how it got to be the book, might explain, might help us understand how it's, why it's written the way it is. So, so Augustino, I was, I was at Naval Postgraduate School. I was probably on my last few months there. I had been pretty forward leaning on my thesis. So at this point I was more or less coasting, you know, finishing up thesis revisions, had a couple classes, elective classes. And so my workload at Naval Postgrad was, was pretty manageable. What was your thesis? So my thesis was looking at the disparity in democracies, and it was a comparative case study but the, between the democratic trajectories of Mali and Niger, which all went out the window the moment there was a coup. So, so thank God it got published. So, but, but not only that, so, so I'm going to tell you, I wrote a book while I was doing a master's thesis, which you know, sounds, I think, sort of impressive, but it has to be mentioned this was actually my second back-to-back master's. So I had done a part-time master's before getting into Naval Postgrad. Then Naval Postgrad was a full-time master's. So I was like poised to write. I was ready. I mean, my writing skills were the best they had ever had been. My research fill skills were, were really great. So bring, taking this on was, this to me was writing a few extra papers. And I had the time since I had sort of these extra thesis electives, which were basically non-electives, and my thesis was mostly written. So I was doing revision work at this point. So I had the available space and my, my mental, my cognitive skills for writing were really sharp at that time. So that's when I started this. And the way Augustino originally wanted to do this book was it was to be, you know, food and battle was, I remember how he sold it to me. And he had a lot of knowledge on, on, on food and what he needed was someone to sort of talk about the, the, the battle, the military operations. And the idea is this was gonna be a coffee table cookbook, right? And so we have the photographs and he was gonna do these recipes and then each, each chapter would have some aspect of the military operations, which then would have a corresponding dish or dishes and lots of photographs. It didn't work out that way. You know, what, what I've learned of the publishing process is it's very challenging. And what the author wants isn't necessarily what the author gets because, you know, it has to be what, what ultimately sells. So so we, we did a lot of work. We wrote several chapters. I think I wrote about three or four chapters and he, he did his part. And at that point, I transitioned. I moved to a new job. I was sort of unable to continue to support the project. And, you know, sort of he had it from there. So I don't hear anything for a while. About some time later to the tune of years, I think maybe we did a little bit of back and forth of doing some edits and then again, nothing. And so did, so I haven't heard anything for to the tune of years. And then Alex Merrow comes in. And Alex, I've worked with before on some of these articles about Bella Wood. So Alex is a, he's a historian, PhD historian. I think I got a, I believe he got his PhD out of Georgetown. He's, you know, has, has an impressive, you know, resume as, as, as PhD historians do. Right. And Alex is also a German speaker and lives in Germany. And so he had done, we had done some work on Bella Wood and translation of some German war diaries. My German is not nearly as good as obviously Augustine is fluent. And so is Alex. Mine's okay. But we had done some work for some Bella Wood articles. So Alex was brought, brought in. And, and so what we developed at that point, Alex helped reshape the story. I wrote some more chapters. I wrote an additional chapter and Alex at that point kind of took it and got it past the goal line. But again, I lost sight of it for a few years and it wasn't until about a year ago, Alex contacts me. He's like, Hey, we're getting this thing published. I'm like, Holy smokes. Right. So, so it was a pretty, yeah, it was, 
looking back, it's a cool experience. During the process, it was frustrating, but it was neat how we all came together because we all brought different aspects to the book. Augustino had sort of a lot of this culinary history, as well as, you know, being able to describe cuisine. And he's, you know, an incredible journalist, so a great storyteller. I, I wrote a lot of the military operations aspect of logistics, marching camps, their supply bases, some, some of the battle anecdotes of particular battles that used a technique or not. And then what, what Alex brought in is Alex brought in a lot of the primary sources uh, work with Caesar. So I use some of that, but Alex really got into sort of Caesar himself and looking at his, 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 his books. And at that point, kind of wove the story together, centered more around sort of Caesar's thought. And so that's sort of how, how we have the book as it is. And, and it's interesting because it plays to all of our strengths and, and we work really well together. And we're continuing to do that now in sort of once the writing, now the work begins of trying to publicize this book, right? So uh, we've written a couple articles or we're, we're all actually writing articles, but Alex has been sort of helping me back and forth and editing some of the articles I've come up with to kind of promote the book on some various sites on, on, on various periodicals or, or online sources. But, uh, but what's interesting about, and, and so one the other aspect, which we didn't talk about, and where I also came in, so why Roman? Like, you know, so military Roman. Well, I, I'd been a Roman reenactor for many years. I'm actually, I've been reenacting for many, many years since I was about 10 years old. And I've done several time periods to include Imperial Roman, which is later than history, by about, uh, later than Caesar by about 100 years. Right, but, and that, now, but you're not like typical reenacting, not like American history reenacting. I do that too. I do lots of it, but Damn. yeah. And if, I kind of think that's fascinating because it, to me, it's like, it's like wide open range acting in a way, but it's so incredibly involved. I can't imagine, I don't know, it's, to me, it sounds like maybe I have a romanticized view of it, but it's probably a lot of hard work, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a lot of crafting. So, so I'm the dad you want when you have school projects because I can, I... <laughs> I can craft like a champ. So I got into it at a very early age and, and, you know, is kind of this interest in military history. I was very young, you know, I would go run around the yard and play soldier. And all of a sudden I learned that as an adult, there's guys that run around the yard and play soldier and they play old soldier and they have these really cool <laughs> costumes. So it was like Halloween play soldier. This is great. Why wouldn't everybody do this? Right. And I went to a local historic site. It was Newbridge landing up in Northern Jersey. Where, where are you from? Northern Jersey. Okay. And I live in Vienna, Virginia right now. So okay. just, I think you're in Fredericksburg. Is that right? Or? No, no, I'm down oh. at the coast. I'm in Portsmouth. Oh. Okay. Maybe, I, I was trying to, okay, got it. So, and I've been down there quite a few times recently. So I'd started, <laughs> well, no, through, well, as a Marine and then, and then as uh, uh, various reenactments. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Right. The triangle. Right. Yeah. So I started with that and what I really enjoyed about it was sort of the hands-on aspect of history and and the material culture of reenacting. And so this is important because this comes into the story and what you realize is that the the ancient period is truly looking at history through a soda straw. And we just have the briefest glimpses of what history was like. Or, or, or what the world was like at that time. And, and and unfortunately, we have a lot of gaps that we have to fill in, which is which is interesting. So like there's a bit of this kind of creative conjecture. And I don't want to say creative of like we get loopy with it, but right, we know one point in history, some demarcation, some event, some historic find, some piece of archaeology, whatever it is. And we might not know the rest of the story till like 50 or 100 years later. And so we're trying to fill in the gaps of what happened in between. Caesar was an incredi incredibly prolific writer and his writings survive, which is, which is it's like great surreal. for us. But they're his writings, right? So we always have to wonder, and, and we make comment to that many times throughout the book, right? Like Caesar talks about one thing or doesn't talk about that. another. I love that. I love that about the book. I, but, I mean, there's nothing like a primary source is there. <laughs> right, but, but like, you know, he mentions it, why, right? Why does he mention, you know, he, you know, his troops were hungry, but still willing to fight for him, right? Is this, was this, you know, some sort, was this building up his own leadership? Was it really true? We don't, we don't know, but, but we try to speculate, right? And we try to step in his shoes and, and we call from other historic, you know, 
historians of the time, right, who were who were writing a hundred years later, Plutarch and, and Caesar's lives, right? He wasn't around with Caesar, but he's writing about Caesar. Sure. You know, and we almost consider that a primary source, which I think arguably might might not actually it's a primary source for that time, but 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 he's kind of he's writing about Caesar well after the fact. He doesn't have primary first hand knowledge of Caesar. Well, I mean, if it's all relative, it's about <laughs> as close to a how about if it's as close to a primary source as right. you can possibly get? But, How about that? But, so reenacting that time period or studying about that time period is really interesting because you I have bet. these gaps. And as and as a reenactor, what I'm looking for is the material culture, right? How do I create a living classroom for the audience? How do I, you know, and different reenactors do it different ways. Some is, some it's just, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a living museum, touch and feel and, and yeah, hold this yeah. and see how much it weighs, right? And some get into sort of these first person narrative or do these skits, uh, or sometimes they do a third person narrative of, of, of sort of, you know, I'm a soldier and what I, you know, I, third person is probably more ca common, but some also do this for sort of first person. They give themselves a name and they, you know, sort of portray the world as they think, as we think. See, you see a lot of those in Williamsburg in colonial right, right, Williamsburg right, right. all the time. Yeah. Yep. So, but but I think that that was my love of history, and that's really what helped me appreciate prim primary sources. I, I I was you know I did undergrad as a historian or, or as a history major, and my work was in my master's work was sort of in this political science, international affairs world. So definitely an appreciation of primary sources through through education, but also through hobby as well. And trying to sort of replicate these things, right? And trying to get your hands on artifacts or, 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 or sketches of artifacts and then recreate those artifacts. And in the Roman world, it's learning how to do leather work, learn, learning metallurgy, learning how to do woodworking, learning, you know, how to work with textiles and which is which is great right like I, I love that sort of stuff i love forging i love sewing and and, and creating and, and making these art you know music i would love to be able to do museum quality replicas of artifacts now that's that's a tall order but that's what i strive for so you know you fascinate me <laughs> because now no how long have you been in the marine corps now you're serving right now i am so i'm at just over 20 years, about 20 and a half years. Or you've been an officer the whole time. You were I nice. have. I went to George Washington University from 96 to 2000, was commissioned in 2000, and then had a very interesting career like many of us. I can't even that. imagine. Yeah, and, I can't. Uh, I mean, what about trial by fire? Listen, I was born at George Washington University 100 <laughs> years ago. The thing is that the reason I'm doing this podcast, so I, I'm this, you are my first Core Stories authors. You, you're the plank holder for that podcast. Oh, God. But, but <laughs> so this doesn't us, go well. <laughs> oh, it will go well. I, I, I'm good at this. I've done this a while. <laughs> Interviewed Marines a while. Not to worry. The, the thing is that I have this view of Marines that I, I want to share with the world that I've had since for many years. And that's the whole point of Core Stories, is to sort of illustrate the way many people don't see Marines for what they are, I think. Um, Marines are an innovative, passionate, beyond intelligent and brilliant level bunch from my perspective. And, and they also have great moral courage. In an ideal world, now look, I'm the first to admit that there are Marines out there who, I call them Marines in uniform only, but they're, they're Marines who just don't, somehow they've lost the, their moral courage. But that's not the point. The point is that most Marines carry on through life with whatever it is that they gained. I don't know if they gained it in boot camp or OCS, but it, it, it solidified it. Sure. And they go the rest of their lives. I mean, I did a lot of research on the top tier medal recipients of the Marine Corps. The, the ones, the Brevet, the Medal of Honor, the Navy Cross. Let me throw her a treat and see if she quiets down. The Navy Cross and other top medals. And I found that so many Marines, they came from nowhere. They, they rose up in very unexpected circumstances to do something profoundly courageous and selfless. And then they go the rest of their lives completely humble. I mean, 
There was a Medal of Honor recipient from Oklahoma who got out of the Marine Corps after the war and he, he delivered mail for 25 years. I don't have honor recipient. And, and now, you know, now that's not so common. That's not likely going to happen. But for most of Marine Corps history, that's who Marines are. So when I read your book, I just kept thinking, I wish I could time travel with the Marine to this time. <laughs> I wish I could time travel to with you three and and sort of have you narrate how all this is happening, you know, because I, it gives me a, it, the book gave me a, a sort of a, a lens to look at Caesar's life. See, I, I very, I love, I'm descended from King Edward III, like a lot of people who are from Britain are, <laughs> and Virginians. And, but I love England. I, lo I love the British Isles. London is, is my favorite city by far. And I learned so much about Britain from your book. I mean, I had no idea that really it was Caesar who brought most of their cuisine and farming to them from what I've learned from your book, or at least strongly influenced it. So, yeah. So, so it, right. So Caesar started it but but Britain was really brought into the empire sort of post Caesar but 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 Rome right and 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 the army that Caesar created that was sort of turned over into what became the imperial Roman army which, which I think yes. would be fair to say right but I, but I learned that from your book is what I'm saying is that I didn't know that before then I hadn't appreciated that before then, even though I've been to Hadrian's Wall and spent a lot of time yeah. in Oxford yeah. well it, it's amazing what 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 the Roman Empire, what it did to the world and its lasting effects, right? Yeah. And if you look at the, the, you know, you look at the Roman roads and you overlay a map of modern highways and they, they, they're they the same. Yeah. Some of these Roman ruins are still being in use today, right? I mean, they're pedestrian bridges or bicycle bridges, but, but they're still, oh. these are the bridges that were created, the roadways that were created yeah, I mean, some, the, the stonework on Hadrian's Wall, again, post Caesar, but the stonework on Hadrian's Wall inhabits farmhouses and cathedrals all across Britain, Northern England, and Lower Scotland. Scotland, right? right. So, and, and, and the cuisine too, right? And, you know, we look, there were some of these studies that we picked up that were put on by, by various academics who studied the refuse piles of these sites and looked at what bones were consumed. And, you know, by examining the bones and looking for, you know, tool marks on the bones, we know that they were, you know, skinned and, 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 and prepared and, and eaten. But we look at grain, right? We look at various grains that, what grew in that area. And we, you know, again, not, not my, my work, we borrowed from that work and we, we, we incorporated that work. And what we learned is that, you know, Romans brought seeds with them, and sometimes the seeds didn't work. So sometimes, it, what what wouldn't survive in one climate, they they use substitutes, right? So they 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 incorporated what was locally available with what they could bring, and then what together would survive that would make dishes that they were familiar with, right? And 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 so yeah, I mean that right. Their influence was all across Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East which was, you know, in incredible, right? Incredible. And, and this is in an age where, where news traveled as fast as a man could take it, right? Whether the man was on horseback, the man was on foot, or maybe some, some, some largely you know, primitive sailing, right? That was not even really open ocean worthy, right? It was sort of this coastal sailing vessel that could cross the Mediterranean, maybe and maybe make it but it was really sort of this coastal vessel and and stuff was powered a little bit a little by sail more by manpower and you know by draft animal, right and so this is what that that world was created under those conditions which which absolutely blows my mind i love i love that and i like i say i you know i definitely see the the influence of these the different scholarships of the authors here but it there is such a strong Marine Corps slant to the book, you know, Marine Corps logistical slant and you know, the way you compare that the, what each Roman soldier was expected to be able to carry as he marched all day long is, 
you know, I think you said eerily similar to exactly what. <laughs> well, funny enough, it actually feels really close too. So the old flak jacket that was sort of kind of went away in the 90s was the, the flak, not no longer the interceptor vest with the plates, but the earlier flak jacket, which was sort of a, a legacy of the Cold War, feels like Roman armor. I mean, I've worn them both and they feel exactly the same. You could even make an argument that the armor of the Cold War was not too different from the Roman armor because the armor of the Cold War was designed to protect you against massed Russian artillery, right? So it was it was it was it was it was basically protecting you from 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 firepower coming overhead, right? That's why the 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 the, the, the helmet sort of had that uh, that sort of ridge. It was it was to protect you from an airburst, right? The the armor today's ar today's armor has changed since 2000 has changed. And it's more designed to stop you know a, a bullet from the front. But the older armor had these shoulder pads and neck and high neck collar to stop from artillery fragmentation that was airbursting above you. Well, Roman armor was the way Romans fought was designed to really protect you from the front and the overhead strike because you sort of had this large shield that was protecting you, right? And that protected your body. And then you had this 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 body armor. At the time of Caesar, it was a, a, a Lorica Hamada, which was a, a, a chain mail armor, which had shoulder reinforcement, almost the same, the same shoulder reinforcement. And then you had this helmet that had a bit of a brow and this sort of sloped back. And, and what that was is as a soldier would be working behind a shield, right, in this sort of the shield, shield wall formation, primarily thrusting his sword through the gaps of the shield or over the shield, right? It wasn't sort of this, glad, this, this Russell Crowe gladiator, large theatrical combat of one-on-one. -on -one. It was sort of this meat grinder of the sword poking through and, and just trying to stab, right? Just trying to get three inches. And typically we think not even the guy in front of him, but the guy to the side. So you were actually fighting your opponent would be to the right. And so the reason why you're fighting to the opponent to the right is because he's actually focused on your guy to the right. And he's not focused on your sword coming in on a diagonal that just needs to get two or three inches. And there's Chloe in the back. Oh, he's sorry, just, she is sweet. Yeah. Uh, what later weird. head down. But your armor was designed to protect you from the overhead blow of 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 the the gall or the kelt that had you know a, whatever a, a sword and an axe that was coming over the shield wall and trying to strike you. So it was designed to protect your head, your neck, and your shoulders, shoulders. right? That wasn't protected from sort of this shield, right? right? And so so yeah, so so it, it I mean it was the same stuff, right? Not not the same, but 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 eerily the same, right? And the weight was was about the same. You know, the, the rations were are, were different, right? But but caloric value was a concern and it's a concern today. So, you know, what what and and the ability to 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 weather the elements, right? And stay stay viable as a ration, right? And you know, ours is done differently today. It's packaged and stuff, but again, the same thought, right? I needed to get rations. I needed to get rations that could that wouldn't spoil and that had and that had caloric value and 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 were refreshing in the case of Pasca, right? Right. That had, so that's what I, I had to ask you about. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt that. Yeah. Because so Pasca is essentially a little bit of kind of old wine, a lot of water, coriander, yep. maybe so, honey, something. But the point of it is, I wanted to ask you. Do you think that the fact that there was a bit of vinegar in the that it was it was churn it was churning it was headed to vinegar that that actually provided some water purification qualities? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And and we look at you know this is not uncommon or this is not unique to the Roman period. We no. see this we see this well up until certainly the 1700s where where alcohol rations. Were, were were put into water to, Purify it. to make it safe. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, I know germ theory wasn't understood until I, I believe it was late 1800s, early 1900s. Please, I need to fact check myself on that. But 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 they knew that water could be bad and that you could you could somewhat Get inoculate sick. yourself from bad yeah. water by by alcohol and and whether it was you know ciders, beers, or wines or, 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 or stronger spirits, you could, th that would keep you from, from getting sick. Uh, 
did they know the 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 the, the, the science the behind it yeah science behind it no but but they knew it worked right uh, so yeah yeah no i think it, it absolutely was for purification purposes so you didn't get sick and this isn't this is an issue of like of of modern water being spoiled this is natural bacteria that has always been there right this is absolutely yeah and and it, and traveling that they're they're encountering all kinds of different chemical compounds because of the different water sources all throughout their travels sure. right right and anyway i thought i i didn't I didn't see go too deeply into that aspect of the value of Pasca. Pasca? Did I pronounce that correctly? Pasca? Yeah, uh, as I understand it, yeah. But you know, as you as you described it, Caesar sort of looked down his nose at beer. Yeah. So the Romans looked down their nose at beer, right? Yeah. It was it was, and, and you know, they, they dairy products too. Up until the imperial period, when dairy, you know, they did make their own cheese, but but even. Even dairy was seen as something barbaric and uncouth because it was it was you know, consumed by by outsiders. Well, also there's this the the contamination concerns with dairy and meat, right? Sure, right, right. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can only assume, but but yeah, I mean, that's not the Romans weren't the first to to realize that, right? The, anyway, the, it's sort of like these random thoughts come to me about the book, but the main thing was that I really valued how I really valued the the slant from a a military perspective but I I also learned so much about I learned so much about Britain and but let's talk about food for a little bit <laughs> so so basically you talk about hardtack and hardtack you know hardtack has been a a staple throughout time kind sure. of yeah. I mean I have to say that when I'm sick um, my first go-to is a saltine cracker, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that it's kind of, it's sustenance. It's, it provides the beautiful carbs when you need a little oomph. And that's, and that's, you know, kind of, some things have not changed. Now, I thought very interesting that there really was not much. I, I just think the main thing is the logistics, that, that there was no one period of time in warfare because Caesar conquered so much of the planet, so much of the hemisphere, that that there really was no one place that he could rely on the the resources to be one specific kind of resources, fruits, vegetables, specific meats, right. spe specific grains. Right. But did he but did he figure it out? Now hardtack was sort of the always the fallback food for them and i and you describe in the book that basically they they wanted to fall back on hard tech because they didn't want to risk the troops didn't want to risk getting sick they didn't want to risk getting sick with meat they didn't want to risk getting sick with dairy or whatever and not just hard it was grain it, it was more grain, yeah, it was yeah, grain yeah. yeah so hard tack was one way it was prepared and there was and pitch, right? the porridge yeah, yeah porridge which sounds awful <laughs> No, 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 no. Yeah, no. I, I, I love oatmeal. I'm, you know. Yeah, but I don't think it was oatmeal. This, no, I, this, this wasn't apple cinnamon. <laughs> this was cold porridge. It's probably more like overnight oats, right? It would probably be more, more, more of what it was like. And then there was also just sort of cooked bread, right? Uh, and and that that has been around too, or it continues to stay. All those things continue to to stay in one one way, shape, or form. In fact. I told you I do reenacting and I do a lot of American Revolutionary War reenacting. And one of the things we do is ash cakes, which is basically flour, a little bit of salt, water formed up into a ball. And you literally put it in the gray ash of a fire. And over time it cooks and it has sort of this pizza dough, like the end, the, 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 the rim of a pizza quality to it. And it was, you know, more or less, that's what we believe. That was one way to prepare the grain uh, as well. So, so grain, which would be milled by the soldiers, was 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 the staple, right? And grain was, you know, yes, it could certainly spoil if if it got wet. Certainly, salt water would spoil it. But grain was arguably one of the more resilient food items that that could be stored, transported, and distributed, and then converted into you know edible food with not 
too much effort, right? Like uh, yeah, relative effort and could be relied upon and measured, right? You, you know, animals, you, you slaughter animals, the meat's good for only so long. Uh, yeah, oddly, the, 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 the Romans, while they ate meat, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of what we, you know, it wasn't like Americans were like, you know, it's not food unless there's red meat attached to it, right? But, but meat was, was consumed, but it wasn't the main course, right? It was these grain dishes for, for the main course. And, but and yeah, I, I think that, that in logistics, right? Like grain was measurable and, and you could, and it was reliable and, you know, you could, you could keep it for the winter months. You could distribute it out. Of course, it wasn't the only thing. Local forage was was absolutely part of the game plan. Meat would 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 use would be used to substitute it. But then you also had other stuff like you know, salt and oils that would be used to provide fat and other other you know electrolytes and then pasca right to uh, sort of make it work. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we don't. There's, well, there's lots of things that we don't appreciate about the time period, but where the day we, li- you know, how we live today, you know, carbohydrates don't really mean much, right? They, we just consume them. We just, 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 just devour them. But when you don't have carbohydrates and you get hit with them, they, they are an energy source when you, when you're, when you're not used to them. So, so to have sort of these energy sources that were available, put you at advantage over your adversaries, right? If you could, if you could get your army to move you had an advantage. And, and I, I, I really appreciate this when I was doing work in Africa with African militaries and seeing the effects of caloric deficit on soldiers, right? And they also had other deficit. They didn't sleep well because of malaria and, 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 and other issues and sickness and the heat. But you, they could not perform at the level that U.S. troops could, it had nothing to do with intellect or biology. It had everything to do with 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 sleep and calories, right? And so, if you could infuse calories and have rested troops, you were able. You know, you had an army that was active, and if you were active, you could be more active than the enemy, and thus thus outmaneuver him, right? So, you it was like maneuver warfare by calories. Well, I mean, this this isn't. This isn't rocket science, but you you document it so well that you, it makes you realize the the impact of it. I mean, I I like you. Um, I'm wrapping up my second master's degree in 18 months. I finished a master of arts, and now I'm wrapping up a master of science. And very cool. Well, thank you. But what I find is there was you know sort of life events with this pandemic and some tragedies in my life because of it that and then trying to to meet the requirements of the of the degrees the degree this degree the second one has led to a tremendous amount of stress this way and i had never really encountered exhaustion before in my life i had never really encountered you know i mean we live in in such an age we have every single food we could want but when you're not taking care of yourself you know you find yourself hungry, but you're too tired to eat, you know? Sure. So, so when you wrote about how that military science has been throughout time, that well-fed and well-rested troops are, are really what wins the battles, that you can lose it. How did, how did, it was a great quote in the book. You can lose a battle without any fighting at all if, if your troops are starving or something sure. like that. I thought that was really fascinating because... And what you're describing, though, is that that happens even now. Yeah, no, I mean, we 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 absolutely do see it in 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 some of the in some countries where there is food insecurity, or or health insecurity for that matter, right? Like, again, I spent I spent several months in Liberia, but I, I've worked with several African militaries. But it wasn't just Liberia. It, I'd see I was in the Republic of Georgia, and a very similar thing, right? And you. You had food insecurity and you had guys who were not rested because they, you know, their daily life, the transaction cost of life was just so high, right? Like to get to point A to point B, you had to walk, you had to hitchhike, you had to get on a bus, you had to like get a ride from somebody to somebody. And it was like the transaction cost to do everything just consumed your, 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 your mental capacities, right? You were exhausted. Your bandwidth. Decision-making, yeah. you were physically exhausted. You were, you, you, you were 
you're malnourished in the process because you couldn't afford or couldn't get access to it. And guys were just, just, just worn out, right? And just didn't have it in them because they, they, they could not sustain, you know, the human machine. So being able to sustain the human machine, you know, and, and, and there's the mental aspect too, right? Just the morale aspect. Oh, of course. Uh, right. Which, which, you know, the, the, the Romans did, you know, developing, you know, bringing up standing legions, which is something I don't think we talk about too much in the book. I, I spoke, I wrote about it a little bit in a later article I did, but, you know, Caesar inherited the Marian reforms, which had named legions. So, so, so the legions, while the, the troops might move out, you know, the, the, the legion, the, the icons of the legion stayed, the deities of the, 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 the legion stayed, and the legion had its own legacy, its own esprit de corps, despite the troops moving in and out. So that was also another aspect of it that, you know, and, and, and you, you were fighting for more. There's some argument as to whether they were fighting for Rome or fighting for their generals, but, but essentially you were fighting for more than just yourself and your immediate tribe. Maybe that's a, a safe way to, to put it. Right. So when, when your leader, when your, when your tribal leader collapsed, it was like, well, okay, you know, who do we join now or we give up? There was a, you were serving something greater than that. Well, let's go back to the food insecurity business, because you had described that the federal, the government that, then had taxed the public for to provide requisition of of food items grain mainly right mm -hmm. and i thought that was interesting so that there was that this this was not something that caesar had to do all by himself that the that they valued it and that they had so that there was a there was a there was a food chain. There was a there was a supply chain there, based on the revenues of the gov government revenues. Strategic level, you know, operationally, tactically, we don't know to the level that 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 system endured, was that right? Effective? Right. But but we know strategically there were grain deposits, and you could certainly, if you knew you were coming upon a campaign, you could forward locate them. There would always be an element like the strategic reserves wouldn't always catch up or would just take too long or would be too unreliable. But but you at least had those. You at least had those to start with. The Navy will send out purchasing agents out forward to to buy local, you know, to requisition fresh fruits and vegetables to bring on board the ship. And and that's still still done, right? So we do have our reserve of stockpiles and and, and MREs that we can, you know, whether they're they're prepositioned or whether they're coming from CONUS and, and we could set up de depots, but there was also local requisition. When I was in Iraq or Kuwait first, then ultimately Iraq during the invasion, and then subsequently after that, there wasn't a single water bottle that was, you know, Dasani Pepsi brand water, right? It was all locally procured from local vendors. You know, yes, we had military rations, but we would have, they'd be supplemented by local or you know regional maybe fruits and vegetables so 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 that idea is still there right i think you know on time logistics allows us certainly to rely more on conus or allied food sources than than sort of local requisition but the idea of local requisite requisition isn't hasn't been abandoned it's still very much there i just love it again i i i feel like the book brought me back in time to but through this lens of modern uh, a modern warfighter, and I like that. I like that. I found that very interesting, and I th it made me think that Caesar was a much more. You know, I guess I'm sorry, but perhaps that stereotype of Caesar is sort of being so incredibly brutal, effective but brutal. And I had really no idea how strategic his thinking was. And when you when you at the beginning of our conversation tonight, you were saying that he said that even though his troops were uncomfortable, they were hungry, or that they fought on. And I don't know that I would have interpreted that as self-aggrandizing. I, I think perhaps he may have been raising them up. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean... I Clearly, they, 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 they won the day on him on numerous occasions where things were not looking so good. 
So, so yes, you know, there, there is some truth to that. The issue is how, how rosy or, or how perfect is the picture painted? And, and, and there's, there's kind of a credible argument that, you know, he, he, he wrote things to, to ultimately depict himself in probably the most positive light. All right. There's not a lot of self-deprecating Caesar. Well, I mean, and it, that's not, he's trying to affect his legacy, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we see that now. It's yeah, not, right. Like, it's okay. very common. So, but, and there is some concern. I mean, you know, I'm a communication scholar. There's questions about, there's questions about translation. Sure. Yep. And so I wouldn't, I, I'm not at all concerned about that, but I, but just by the actions that you have outlined in this this book. I know that you know you say it's not really a coffee table book like maybe you had expected it initially, the envisioned it to be, but it is kind of timeless. It is a book that, you know, will have value over over time. I like that about it. I, I one of the things that I hope and I didn't sort of realize it until I sort of reread it myself was that I hope it can it can bring those who who aren't regularly interested in ancient history into ancient history right yes. I, hope, I hope i hope we can capture a couple foodies out there who say hey this book's got some interesting stuff on food history right or it's got yeah. some interesting stuff on military operations that are you know timeless or you know there's there's examples or, or that you know we could you, you could draw parallels uh, to or or, or or draw from so I think it has, you know, it's obviously getting that message out there that, you know, no, this isn't just a book about Caesar. In fact, it's actually, it's, it's actually more about Caesar's military and the legacy or of, of that military. Yes. Um, and that, and the impact that that military had uh, on, 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 on military science and, and the war and the cultures around it. So, so yeah, so I think it, it, it has the ability to, to cross bridges. In fact, one of the things we did is we draw we drew a number of modern parallels. We 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 wrote a chapter that 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 connected the North Af the Allied North African campaign to to Caesar a little bit, right? It was the same, you know, roughly the same part of the world. He was out, wasn't exactly the same, but 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 close enough. And here was an entity fighting abroad, right? And so how how did they how did they do it? in in a particularly austere environment? Yes. And so we drew that connection. I actually just just recently did a supporting article that compared and contrasted Caesar and Rommel, which uh, just published the other day on Military History Now, which is an online publication, and it compares Caesar's siege of Avaricum in Gaul to Rommel's siege of Tobruk. In, in 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 North Africa, Libya during World War II, and some of the the supply challenges they had, the 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 operational challenges, the tactical challenges they had, and sort of dealing with, you know, an, an enemy in a strong point, and there was also an enemy in the field that that you know could threaten his supply, and so how how did they they work through those those challenges? But there's definitely interesting parallels that, that we still see, right? We and the stuff I brought about the you know the the modern load being very similar to the Caesarian era soldiers' load and you know rations and you know stuff we see in Afghanistan and Iraq and how it's not too you know too dissimilar. There's 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 timeless aspects to it. There so. there really are. I I really enjoyed it, and I of course enjoyed the photography the sort of scene of perhaps maybe how a table would have been yeah that's augustino's work yeah. i know it is so creative that way but it did you know kind of made me <laughs> made me think about the value of coriander in ways <laughs> i had i mean i love coriander i i really but i love middle eastern and eastern foods so yeah i think one aspect which i'd be remiss to not talk about which which just really fascinates me is that all this was done, right? So I talk about, you know, it was done by, you know, manpower and rowing power and draft animals yes. and, 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 you know, wooden carts and horses. And and the thing we often overlook is without maps, like really without maps. I mean, the, that's the, crazy. The, that the, is the, the craziest thing. 
the geospatial awareness is something that we cannot or, or geospatial in awareness is something that we cannot fathom, right? Like we have, we have satellites, like the power of satellites in our hand, right? All of us. And yet the average Gaul didn't know much beyond what he, he personally experienced and maybe what someone told to him through some oral tradition, right? Like that was it. And, and the, the Romans were only marginally better, right? They had these uh, itineraries, which I think best explained as sort of a subway map. Think of like the Metro yeah. map of DC, right? Like, okay, you, you know, you kind of know there's a river, there's, you know, this monument, but if you keep following this path, you'll eventually get to something else, right? No real it's time a schematic, a schematic awareness, right? No, 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 no geospatial, like true geospatial appreciation of, of, of elevation or, or, or types of terrain. That's the value in a straight road, right? <laughs> I mean, essentially, that was the whole point of him having complete, just move everything out of the way because yeah. he didn't really want to account for all of But what, it, what, what the Romans had over, over others was that they at least had some frame of reference, however limited, right? Yes. That they could do some sort of planning. They knew it took so many days to get from point A to point B, right? We could, we could plan that out. We could do operational planning. We could account for logistics we could set up de depots caesar did 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 commission maps of the world made they don't survive the earliest maps come i think the early they're, they're, they 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 post date caesar by by a couple decades that that actually do survive but that level of geospatial awareness was was uncommon to to caesar's enemies or unknown and yet it was so so limited compared to what we know now. And the fact that they, they did it, it, it it's, I, I have, I, I don't think there's any way we could appreciate having that level of, of, of ignorance to mm -hmm. the world around you. That's why I say, you know, the, the whole time travel thing, I just kept imagining trying to just sort of be in a drone, watching this, watching him figure it all out and, it's fascinating to me. I, th I think it was. A, I think it's a very interesting book. It's a quick read. I thought it was a very quick read, even though it's clearly written by in an academic style. Right. Your, your style of writing is academic. I can see a little bit of Augustino's voice in there. I love Augustino's writing. I love his writing style, but I, you know, I see so much more of the Marine Marine Corps leader yeah, book, yeah. I, I think i'd be remiss if i didn't say you know alex alex was a, an incredible contributor i mean i i definitely was the junior partner of this of this triumvirate uh, well i understood that i mean there really is great scholarship in the book i can uh, see i can see that and i yeah. i understand that there's there's history but but in front of me today and the point of this series is to talk about marine's contribution to the book world and i so i really have enjoyed i have enjoyed this and i enjoyed the book and i i would highly recommend i mean i downloaded it because there was a sort of a time crunch thing but i think that i would like is it available in hardcover it is yep it's it's available several places so casemate is so pen and sword or frontline is uh who published it they're out of the great UK. publisher they're a US old, very old publisher. They do, and they do a lot of military history, which yeah. uh, which is you know great for people like me. And then Casemate is their U.S. distributor, and Casemate again carries a lot of niche military history, great uniform books, great books on on on, on war gaming if, if if that's your thing, great mm -hmm. books on you know different aspects of of military history and you know unit histories and whatnot or you know histories of particular units or, or, or leaders so that's that's casemate so you can buy directly from them but then there's a number of small-time military booksellers that sell it. and then lastly and obviously amazon it's available through amazon in the kindle version and and hard copy version and you know I, kindle's great it's accessible it's 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 economic for everybody but the hard copy has some beautiful pictures in it. that's that's what i'm thinking that's what i'm is there any hope for an audiobook 
I have no idea. I, I think we have to see if, if, if we get past hard copy and then soft copy. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I love audiobooks and they're so accessible. Even though the photography would be missing, this would make a great audio book because it's, it's so rich. So uh, I, I think this, you know, there. when we do, when we, you know, the, the, the calculations can be interesting. I, I think I love that stuff that, that blows my mind of you know, how we start calculating out, right. What stuff weighed and how much they had and how long it took and, you know, how many animals it would take to, to, to bring it. Right. And that's where the scale just like blows your mind. Right. And, and, and we think, and again, not just today's scale, but this was 2000 years ago, right. We, you know, we were you know, getting cartage and, draft animals to you know feed feed armies in 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 units of of 5000 right so you know multiple legions at 5000 text 5000 strong maybe they were you know there's been argument that maybe they were really only 3000 strong but whatever right when you start putting 3 4 5 of them together plus auxiliaries and 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 the the support personnel right we have tens of thousands of people who are being that's that was another thing I didn't appreciate. Your book explained how much support. Right. There, right I mean, it's right. add another ten percent at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the, the animals and the chains, you know, the, the baggage chains that would just would just go on. Fasc fascinating. Yeah. Gregory, this has been very interesting. I I, I thank you for sitting down with me and talking. Thanks to me about for having it. me. I mean, I, I I've lucked out from 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 great friendships personal and professional in this whole experience of uh, being brought on by Augustino and supported by Alex and you know their continued support as you know as we write articles to promote this book and you know they 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 help with the editing and 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 help me with my arguments so I've you know if anything I've I've benefited the most because I've I've really had you know these these th these great minds and 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 prolific writers help me out and, and bring me along. Yeah, and that's as it should be. Is this your first book? It is. It is uh, a couple articles, but but first book, you know, two two theses. So, but, but that's it. Hmm. Is it? What's the plan for the future here? I, I don't know. So I'm looking at transitioning out of the military probably within uh, a couple of years here. I really like Northern Virginia. It's 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 good to me. It's it's good for my family. I I love the Marine Corps. I, I do, but as as I became more senior, what what I kind of failed to really appreciate was was you know you, you think you one might think as they become senior they have more control over their own destiny in the Marine Corps that's not the case as that's you not the case. and in schools and the moves are just they come quicker and they're harder and 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 so that was that was more than 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 I could my family could endure so yeah. we I've had a great great run of it but DC is a great place for me to to transition over as to what's next I, I, I don't know you know maybe I'll be working at Colonial Williamsburg as a costumed interpreter I, I actually I would love to do that I would love to be a costumed interpreter at one of these national parks uh, I don't know if I could maintain the family at like 1250 an hour uh, it would yeah. be It'd be really hard. So maybe that's that's my. I have to find another job, but then retire a second retirement. Then I get to do that job. But uh, gotcha. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, I don't know if they're hiring, but it seems to me there's a lot of turnover there. Although, I have been there many times. It's my go-to place to celebrate anything is to be the trellis restaurant, but they've closed the trellis through this COVID, which is a Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg iconic restaurant, the most iconic restaurant yeah. closed. In this. But I love it there. I mean, I, I love it there and I love encountering these reenactors. Re there was a woman who has worked there 32 years or something as a reenactor at the governor's mansion. And I mean, I, I think it's just a charmed life, you know, yeah. to, and, and the costumes, like you say, I mean, I've, I have stopped reenactors and asked, asked them, could I just please take a picture of your costume? Because it's so epic. So I would have to say that, that, that the staff at Colonial Williamsburg are, are more than just reenactors. They are, they are, you know, some of them are, are, are incredible historians of renown in their various fields but but they all are are historians in their own right and yes. really you know typically they're very material culture uh, artisanal crafts focused and they do amazing things for history and maintaining historic trades and doing 
research on historic techniques of, of construction of all manner of, of items, right? And, and so they do a lot of really great work. And, you know, they, they are not wearing costumes. Those, th those are museum quality replicas. They are. They really are. I'm glad you, I didn't have the right term. No. It, Thank it, you for, for pointing that out because, <laughs> because it really is. And I, I mean, they're just, especially the women's. I mean, I've been there in summer, I've been there in winter and they have different, they have different outfits on, but they're all hand like stitch design for their specific body. And it's just, you, I have to, I ask them, I say, is this really, really the way they dressed back then? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, I was born in the wrong century. I mean, the, they're so beautiful. They're just so, oh, uh, anyway, I mean, I, clothes today are really kind of throwaway. They weren't there. Yeah, th th well, th it was, th that's, a, that's a whole nother. That's I a whole, never, whole, okay, that's a, but I'm just trying to talk about what yeah. working. I'm sorry. I kind well, of, you will, we'll be needy, we'll be in this rabbit hole together. I mean, <laughs> the, the whole point though, I do, I would say though, is that there is, there's beautiful history in this and uh, I really value the book. I really value the book and I, again, it's a quick read. I don't know if it's because I think I found it so interesting, but even, I mean, even the writing style being academic, it kind of blew right through it, you know? I, I really loved it. So I wouldn't want anyone to be scared off that it's, it has that style. It's not, uh, it's not terribly a commercial writing style. It's, it's definitely a little heady, but I, I loved it. So. Well, anyway, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you for, for enduring it. You know, if, if I may, there, there's probably two people I need to mention. Which, Please. Which I, so, so the first is Sean Richards. And Sean Richards was the unit commander of the 9th Legion, which was the reenactment group, I, the first Imperial Roman reenactment group that I was with out in, in San Diego. And Sean really helped me develop a, a appreciation and understanding of the material and crafting culture of, of the era which which he's done a lot for me and was the one who got me in the gear and still is some someone i talk to you know we have hopes of maybe doing some experimental archaeology projects together which are, are really fascinating and you know we're looking at uh, he he is and and hopefully i can join him on this and fly out there and doing some work on constructing an actual marching camp and 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 you know documenting it, I think, or, or documenting an aspect of it as sort of a, an experiment to see if we could do it, you know, marching, how much time, how, you know, give it, you know, doing a prorated amount of digging for the amount of soldiers, right, like over a course of a legion, but if there's just four of us, how much earth and wall would, would we be responsible for? And I would love to do that with him. I, I you know, the hope is next year sometime we can pull it off. We'll, we'll see. And then, and then Rich Campbell, who's up here in, in Northern Virginia, who's of the 20th Legion, who, who I was never sort of formally a member with, but have, they've, they've given me a home as I, you know, continued some developing items for, for my impression. And they've both been very supportive of, of this work and advertised it. And, you know, so they, both of them really did a great job in, in, in inspiring my interest in Roman history and, and not just inspiring, but like nurturing it. That's always good to know. I love hearing that sort of background and how, how, how we got here, you know, how, how you were inspired to do this. I thank you so much, Gregory. It's been fun. <laughs> if you do another book, please let us know. <laughs> I will. I will. It might take another nine years. <laughs> Is that how long it took for this? Uh, to yeah, I think so. Because it was like 2011. Oh, no, 2010. Late 2010 is when I started. So, yeah, about be nine, 10 years. <laughs> nine, nine, ten years to get it actually happen. So. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good night. I think that was a great interview. What do y'all think? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, think about the book as a great gift, actually. When I read it, I thought of a couple of people who I'd like to give this book to for the holidays. Um, it's good for Marines who, you know, are sort of logistics oriented people, but who like to cook. Anyway, hit subscribe, please. And we'll catch you in the next time. Semper Fidelis. Core Stories, Ordinary Marines, Extraordinary Lives.